I'm super excited to have you on. And I got to tell you, when I first heard about you, it was shortly after I had a client who came onto the podcast. Her name is Megan. Uh, she was sharing her story of a 10-year fertility journey. And she had explained that one of the craziest revelations during the course of her fertility journey was that she had a raging infection in her mouth. And it was, it blew her away. It blew me away. It blew pretty much everyone around her away because this is a woman who had gone through IVF, surrogacy, donor eggs, nothing was working. And it really wasn't until she started addressing dental health and things like that, that she just had this, this point of clarity. So when, when I heard about you, I was like, boom, we got to get Dr. Katie on. This is a conversation that the fearlessly fertile community has got to have because we come from the perspective, Dr. Katie, that the more information, the better. We believe in women being empowered, asking questions and bucking narratives that may not be complete and critical thinking as well. So we're super excited to have you on. Yeah. So why don't you start us off by sharing a little bit about like, how did you get involved? I, we know you're a dentist, but like, how did you really get involved in beginning to empower people when it comes to their overall health? And then we'll talk about fertility. Sure, sure. You know, that story is unfortunately all too common and it's really sad that that happened to her, but it, I'm not surprised to be honest, because this is something that I experienced all the time in my practice. And so I've been practicing since 2010 and because of my journey of how I got into dentistry, which I was in an accident when I was in high school, ran into a telephone pole, broke everything in my face from my eyebrows down. I broke a bunch of teeth, lost a couple of teeth, and they wired my jaw shut immediately that night. And so for two months I had, you know, broken teeth, couldn't brush, couldn't floss. And all I was eating was ice cream, pudding, jello, you know, everything that wrecks your teeth. Right. And so because I couldn't eat well, and because I had, you know, all these broken teeth, I started to develop, you know, infection in my gums. I had abscesses, you name it. I had it going on. And even after they took the wires off, I couldn't open my mouth. My jaw was fused shut for four years and it took nine surgeries to be able to fix just mobility so I could eat and open my mouth and brush my teeth. And what happened was I lost so much weight and my liver started shutting down and my kidneys started not functioning properly. So I learned at a very young age how much your mouth affects your entire body. So that's how I got interested in dentistry. And once I started practicing, it was a few years after I started practicing, I started having all these patients coming to me and I noticed that they all had pretty much the same diseases, right? Most people had heart disease, they had diabetes, they had, you know, arthritis. I was noticing that all these sort of inflammatory diseases were happening together. And so I started looking in and thinking, you know, what in the heck is going on? Because their gums were also a mess and their teeth were also a mess. So if someone was healthy and had no systemic diseases, their teeth and gums were also healthy. But if someone came in and they had a lot of systemic diseases, their gums and teeth were a mess. And so I started thinking, you know, what is causing this? What's the root cause? We can't, I can't just be putting crowns, you know, and doing deep cleanings on everyone. Like we got to fix the underlying issues. So I started digging in and started examining microbiome and salivary testing and things like that and started, you know, really using my patients as guinea pigs to figure out like, is there a relationship here? And I'll never forget one of the first big aha moments was I was practicing in one of my offices and this young couple came to me. They were in their twenties and they had been trying to conceive for a very long time. And the doctors couldn't figure out what was going on because she seemed perfectly normal or perfectly healthy, I should say. And her doctor actually had the aha moment of maybe you should go see your dentist, which let me tell you that never happened. So the, the fact that she said this back in 2014 is, was really revolutionary because no one back then even knew about the oral fertility connection. And so she had found me and this was before I was really advertising that I was an oral systemic health specialist. And so she came in, I took one look at her mouth. I knew for sure that her gums were contributing to her infertility. We ran some tests on her. Sure enough, she had the bacteria that is known to cause infertility issues. So we got her treated. But here's the other thing. Her, I tested her husband because I know, you know, takes two to tango, right? So if you're swapping spit, 
if she's healthy and he's not, he can be transferring that bacteria to, to her, but also that bacteria affects his ability to, to be fertile as well. And so we treated both, both of them and within a couple of months, they were pregnant. Now that could be coincidence. I don't know. But like you said, you've had the same experience of a client coming on saying she had an infection um, that no one knew. And once it was treated, she was able to get pregnant. So as you know, fertility is multifactorial, right? So we need to make sure that we're, we're looking at all the things. We can't just rely on fertility science to, to get us there. Right. Well, and it's super one-sided, right? It And I think a lot of the things that we're discovering over time is that this, com this compartmentalization of biological systems is nonsensical. Totally. Right? We're not just a, a bag of, of organs, you know, it, there, all of these things come together and work together. And I think it's, I mean, I can assure you uh, from my own seven year fertility journey, like nobody even mentioned oral health. I mean, I was psychotic about oral health anyway. I was in, you know, I was seeing my yeah. dentist every six months, like right on the, on the dot yeah. brushing and flossing, but it's these kinds of things and this kind of conversation that I think is going to be so helpful so, sure. okay, so you have that example of, you know, the the couple that you were just talking about, but let's walk through, I mean, because this audience is specifically focused in on fertility, let's break that down a little bit. Like, you know, what is, what would be some of the things that you would be looking for if somebody comes to you and is, happens to be struggling with fertility? Like, where would you even begin that sort of investigation? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the easiest thing to do is to test. You know, if you go to your medical doctor, right, or even for fertility, because I did fertility for six years as well, um, which, by the way, no one once asked me about my oral health, and they knew I was a dentist coming in um, as a patient. Uh, but that's, I digress. So the first thing you want to do when you go in is the same thing that any other clinician does or any other, you know, doctor does when you go to them, you have to test. That's the thing is you can't guess what's going on. You have to run tests. And so a couple different tests that I always do is I do a saliva test because I want to know what bacteria is in the mouth because we know that bacteria in the mouth don't stay in the mouth. You know, we have several microbiomes in our body. We have our, our sinus microbiome, our lungs, our mouth, our gut, and our sex reproductive organs and our skin too. And if those microbiomes are out of whack and not balanced, they're going to fight against you. We're made up of more bacteria than we are human cells. So if those bacteria aren't happy, guess what? They're not going to work in your favor. Mm -hmm. So I always want to do bacteria testing to see if patients have specific bacteria that affect fertility. And then I also want to do something called a 3D um, x-ray. It's called a cone beam CT scan because that allows me to see 360 degrees around every single tooth to see if there are abscesses or infections like what your patient may have had. Because oftentimes infections or abscesses that patients have don't hurt and people don't know that they have them because there's no symptoms, which is probably something that was going on with your client. So I run those two tests and then of course I do a clinical exam and a gum uh, measurement exam as well. But those are the two main tests. Oh, it just blows my mind because I think we're so conditioned to think that if it doesn't hurt, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> Totally. And that's, that's like, you know, if you think about it, that's Darwin, right? It's survival of the fittest. And so if we have bacteria that are trying to harm us, right, the, the last thing they want to do is cause a problem for us because then we're going to know and we're going to want to go fix it. So oftentimes they, they cause this underlying kind of chronic, latent, silent disease. And then you don't feel it until you have some sort of acute catastrophic event, like a heart attack, right? Pe most people don't feel that they have blood pressure issues until they have a heart attack. Same thing with, with gum infection um, and tooth infection. Oftentimes you don't feel it until you blow up and have a swollen face or a tooth falls out because you lost all the bone. Man. Okay. So why don't you share with us? Because like, all right, so you do these testing you know, for the different bacteria, but let's talk about like how does it get from your mouth all the way down into your ovaries and reproductive system or testes for a man? Like, how does it, I mean, obviously it's, things don't stay in your mouth as you said, yeah, but yeah. how does it actually affect fertility? I, 
That is such a smart question. And that's a question that most people don't often ask. So good for you for asking it. <laughs> Presumably you've heard of leaky gut, right? I feel yes. like a lot of people know what leaky gut is. Yeah. So leaky gut is the same thing as periodontal disease or gingivitis in the mouth. So we call it now leaky gums because people are starting to understand the connection between a leaky gut and, and a leaky mouth. So what ends up happening is we have this bacteria in our mouth that are bad bacteria. And so what happens is our body initiates an immune response because it wants to get rid of it. And so one of the things that it does is it releases this enzyme called MMP8. MMP8 goes ahead of our, our immune system, our white blood cells, everything we need to fight this infection. But what it does is it cuts through the tissues to allow our immune, our immune cells to get to the infection. And so by cutting through the tissue, it's making the tissue no longer a protective barrier. And so people need to think of our gums are a protective tissue. It's just like our skin. Our skin's supposed to keep what's in the environment out of our bodies. Our gums are supposed to keep what's in the mouth out of our blood system. Our gut's supposed to keep everything in the colon that's toxic and byproduct ways from getting into our, our system. So when MMP8 gets activated, it starts to break down our gum tissue. Our gum tissue becomes permeable bacteria from the mouth, go through the gum tissue, get into our bloodstream and start circulating. And one of the places it loves to go, unfortunately, is the reproductive system, among other places. Oh, yeah. man. Okay. And there's one bacteria in particular, FN, Fusobacterium nucleatum, that I call it like the uber of bacteria because everyone has this bacteria and, it, and in isolation, it's not bad. But when you have all these other bacteria, it kind of says, come on, jump in with me. And it, they kind of latch on and it takes it around the body and it deposits it right into the uterus. Oh, man. You know, and so so what does it start doing? Like, I mean, so it, I know you had mentioned inflammation. So is that the primary way yeah. that it's impacting the reproductive system is through totally. inflammation? Yeah. So inflammation is really the root cause of all evil. You know, in America, we have, I think there's like eight causes of death, like the main top causes of death and seven out of eight are caused by inflammation, which means that seven out of eight are entirely preventable. And so if we can quiet inflammation, then we can keep our systems quiet and functioning properly. But when you have inflammation, that's when patients run into issues like endometriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease, or something like that. Those are all signs that the body is inflamed and what I call on fire. So inflammation is really the issue. And when we have bad bacteria, the bacteria will inhibit ovulation. It'll inhibit implantation of the embryo. And then it'll also alter effect, negatively affect being able to carry the baby to full term. And FN bacteria is actually responsible for causing stillbirths. Mm. And that is certainly on the rise. Yeah. I had a patient, she was an older woman, she, probably in her mid sixties. And she told me this crazy, this is also when I started getting into saliva testing, she had presumably healthy teeth, healthy gums in terms of pocketing. She didn't have a whole lot of pockets. She didn't have a lot of calculus and plaque on her teeth, but her gums were always bleeding and always receding and she couldn't figure out what was going on. So I said, let's try and do this test. And the only bacteria that came back was FN and it was through the roof. And so I started talking to her about all these things. And I said, you know, fertility, I said, I know, you know, you're not interested in fertility anymore. We're kind of past that, but this does affect fertility. And she says, oh my gosh, she said, I have had four stillbirth babies. And she said, my mom had a bunch of stillbirth babies as well. And I was the only one that made it. And we know bacteria is passed down from generation to generation. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this, you know, could have very likely contributed to her issues over time. Uh, okay, let's go back. So the the bacteria yes. is passed down from generations. So I, so are we saying that like if mama had not so great oral health, that that bacteria maybe maybe passed to baby? I would say definitely. And we know this because bacteria is transmissible, right? So if you're kissing your partner or you're kissing your baby or sharing spoons with your baby or drinking after each other, I mean, you're swapping your microbiome with everyone in your environment around you. So, you know, when someone says, oh, bad teeth are genetic, sure, there's a couple genetic diseases that are passed down, but most often it's not. It's environmental, but it is, it does run in families because we transfer our microbiome to those around us. Oh my goodness. This I mean, this is definitely taking the whole 
you know, because so many women on this journey get into a really dark place thinking it's just me. It's only me. Like, I, I, you know, if we had a dime for every time somebody said, well, it's all my fault. It's like now we're really looking at this from a different perspective, because if that bacteria can be passed, that means that your partner's oral health matters as well. Oh, 100 percent. And and infertility is a 50 50 game. So, you know, I've been through this journey just like you have. Right. And everyone's always like, oh, it's the woman. Even when you go to fertility doctors, they're always talking about the woman. Right. Your issues, your eggs, your eggs are old and and rusty and, you know, they don't work. And but what we know is that male infertility accounts for 50 percent of all infertility in couples. And so we have to look at the man, make sure that they're being healthy, and then also make sure that their microbiome is in check and their gums are healthy and teeth are healthy. Otherwise, they're just going to be the number one, they can pass it to the female. But number two, the bacteria in the man causes their sperm to, it actually kills the sperm. It changes their shape and it decreases their ability to swim. So a lot of men have slow swimmers, right? You hear this all the time, like, oh, I need to do IUI because my husband has slow swimmers. Well, he should get his gums checked because there's two bacteria in particular that will affect the motility of a sperm. Okay, this conversation has my OCD kick in right now. <laughs> like, I don't like flossing everyone that's coming around to <laughs> taking a flash. In. <laughs> I mean, but this is so good, though. I mean, like, because think about the constellation of of information that we have. Like that this is a such a critical aspect. I mean, everything we eat comes in through our mouths. Like it's such an incredibly important aspect of our overall health. And when we zero in on fertility health, it's it's almost completely ignored. Totally. And and contributing, you know, because we've had experts on talking about gut biome and all this other stuff, but nobody's talking about the gums. Like, well, Lord. and here's the thing, gut microbiome, that's our largest microbiome that we have. And our gut, you know, a lot of people say our gut controls everything because it does. It, you know, controls our brain, it controls our immune system, it's our largest immune organ. But if we take a step back and just logically think, which I love that you're all about logic, right? How do bacteria get to the gut? Well, they have to get there through the beginning of the digestive system, which is the mouth. So back to your question of how does bacteria from the mouth get to the rest of the body? Well, one way is through the gum tissue, and that's like the pathologic way, right? We have inflammation, so it goes into our gums and into our bloodstream. The other way, though, is just we're swallowing it. So, you, I mean, we swallow, I think it's something crazy, like 10 billion bacteria in 24 hours. So that bacteria comes from our environment. It comes from people that are around us. It comes from the food that we eat. And so it's really important that we are mindful of what we're putting in our mouth and who we're associating with, and then also keeping our oral hygiene on check. But yeah, wow. we, we got our gut microbiome through our mouth. So that's really important. And the first bacteria, first microbiome that we're exposed to when we are born is through the vaginal canal. Mm, and right. part of it is you're going through the vaginal canal. So you get part of your mom's microbiome that way, but you also ingest part of her fecal matter, which is part of her gut microbiome when you're coming out as well. So you're getting some of mom's gut bacteria, bacteria and some of her vaginal bacteria. And then everything else is acquired after that. It, it's This is incredibly fascinating to me. It's also interesting to me because when I was reading through the materials, it that this can also impact preeclampsia and all and other things that can threaten the health of your pregnancy. Totally. So the, what we know is that oral bacteria, first off, if you have FN in particular, it increases infertility by three times. Um, oral bacteria also have the same effect on trying to conceive as being obese in terms of increasing the, the time it takes to get pregnant. Then once you are pregnant, these bacteria definitely affect the incidence of getting preeclampsia, of getting gestational diabetes and preterm birth. And so what we know is if someone has gum infection, they are 30 to 50% times more likely to deliver early or have a low birth weight baby, which we know is, is really sets the baby up for, for a hard time of being healthy and thriving later on. And 40% of all pregnant people have some form of gum infection. So this is a, this is a big deal. And as we were talking about earlier, before we got on today, most people think that they need to avoid the dentist when they're pregnant. And it's actually the opposite. Uh, they should be going to the dentist and getting these things treated before they're pregnant and definitely while they're pregnant. Wow. 
Well, so it's it's interesting because I also hear a lot of women like talking about and and this is a major conversation I have a lot as well is about the role of stress, things yeah. like that. And you know, do you think that plays a role at all in the it, proliferation of this kind of bacteria or exacerbating it? Yeah, so stress is is detrimental to everything in our life, right? And and there's good stress and there's bad stress. We do want to have some some good stress in our life because that makes us stronger, right? You got to stress things to grow. But when stress becomes chronic and we have a, a mental view of the stress as being negative, that really adversely affects our health. And one way it does is over time, it, we have a constant release of cortisol into our system. Cortisol is, is really, really bad because what it does is it shuts off our immune system. And so that makes us more prone to infections. And so the bacteria that were there definitely will start to proliferate when cortisol is high. Um, which causes more inflammation. And then it's just a roundabout cycle that just keeps going and going. So stress is definitely key, um, something that we want to avoid for sure. And so is there treatment? I mean, it sounds like there, there's there got to be some treatment for this. So what yeah. does that sort of look like? Yeah. So here's here's the thing that we know is that not all bacteria are created equal. And so we want to make sure that our treatments are tailored to whatever bacteria a patient has. I mean, that only makes logical sense, right? If you go to the doctor and you have a specific ailment, they give you a specific treatment for that ailment. But in dentistry in the past, we kind of just threw the kitchen sink at everybody and, you know, everybody got deep cleanings and fluoride, right? We don't want to do that anymore. We want to make sure that we know what we're treating and we treat it appropriately so that it goes away. So one of the things that I like to do, like I said, is I always do the bacteria testing. And then I also add on a test that tests for a genetic mutation in the interleukin-6 gene. And the reason why that's important is because if someone has that mutation, we know that their body it has a basal state of inflammation, meaning you know they're already turned on to inflammation. So that means that anything that is in their mouth that will cause infection will cause an exacerbated response. So for instance, I have this IL-6 mutation that's definitely associated with infertility, with um, heart disease, diabetes, things down the road. So I know I have to be very careful at what I put in my body and how I take care of myself so that I don't end up having one of those diseases. So once I know the bacteria that a patient has, it's really easy for me to treat them. We usually start by doing scaling and root planing, which is just a periodontal cleaning. You know, the bacteria that are on our teeth are different in composition than the bacteria that live in our gums. And so in order to treat gum infection, you have to clean the gums. You can't just clean the teeth. And so you got to get down underneath those gums, do a periodontal cleaning. And then I like to use adjunctive therapies that are specific to that bacteria. So we know that, you know, of the 11 bacteria that I test for, six are resistant to that type of cleaning. So sure, I can get all the, the tartar off the teeth, but the bacteria are still going to live in that pocket and thrive. So now I need to use different modalities to go in and kill that specific bacteria. Sometimes, depending on how severe the infection is and how much it's spread, sometimes I have to use systemic antibiotics, which I don't like doing, but it's necessary. And then once we wipe out all that bad bacteria, it's really, really important to help the patient rebuild their oral and gut microbiome into a healthy state so that now that good bacteria can kind of maintain it. So do you typically follow that up with probiotics or things like that to yes. repopulate yes. the... Yeah. So once you wipe out the bad, you definitely want to put in the good. And so taking high quality prebiotics and probiotics are always super important because you want to make sure you, you continue to to feed the good bacteria. And prebiotics are awesome. You can get those in a lot of your foods. That's all your fiber you know, your Benefiber, your in inulin, any foods that are high in fiber are going to be great prebiotics for you. Wow. Okay. So, cause I, I can already feel like the women listening to this, their hair standing on end yeah. and yeah. like wondering, is there any hope for me? But I mean, well, it clearly this is easy. Like this is something easy you can do when you go on fertility, right? It's shot, 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 you know, draw up the meds, shoot it in your system. Like you got to do this. Now we go in and we, you know, check your cervix and then we scrape the membranes and we like, this is so much easier because it's a spit test that you can do from home. It's a 3D x-ray that you can take at a dental office. And, you know, once once you're clean, just eat some prebiotics. So prebiotics, what they do is it feeds the bacteria that you already have, the good bacteria that you already have. So that's prebiotics. Probiotics is you're actually putting in living organisms into your system. So if you do both, 
you're, you're going to help support the microbiome that you already have. And then you can just maintain on your own at home. I see. Now you described a periodontal cleaning. How is that different Yes, from a regular cleaning? Because I'm sure that the women listening are going to be like, well, I get my teeth cleaned every six months, you know, yeah. but it sounds like this is something different. Yeah. No. And I'm really glad you asked that because that was a main question that patients would say. So again, the bacteria on the teeth are different than the bacteria in the gums. The bacteria that live on the teeth love oxygen. They're gram positive aerobes. So they love oxygen. The ones under the guns are gram negative anaerobes. So they don't like oxygen. So you have to treat them differently. A regular cleaning. So a, a prophylactic cleaning is for someone who is healthy and has no gum infection. That is only going to clean above the gum line. Okay. So it's going to clean the teeth. When you do a periodontal cleaning, that's for someone who has gum infection and which is gingivitis and or a periodontal disease. Now, the difference between the two is gingivitis is reversible. So if you have gingivitis, you can treat it and get rid of it. And that's just when you have swelling of the gum tissue, but no death of the bone around the teeth. When you have periodontal disease, that means the gingivitis has spread from the gum tissue and affected the bone around the teeth. And now the bone's starting to die. So you literally have, you know, gangrene necrotic bone around your teeth. And if you have any of this going on, you have to get underneath the gums and treat those bacteria. Otherwise, it's going to keep populating. So a periodontal cleaning is something that goes underneath the gum tissue, cleans off the root surfaces, debrides that infected gum tissue that's been diseased. And then we use other medicaments as well to help kill the bacteria. So is that something that, I mean, is that done under a local or or, it's not like, or is that kind of a more surgical procedure? Yeah. So that is one step before surgery. So there is Got another it. Okay. surgery you can do if it advances. So if, if your gum disease is out of control and it's advancing and not responding to the, to a periodontal cleaning, then yes, sometimes you do have to go for surgery. But that type of cleaning typically is done under either topical anesthetic. So they can either put like a like a gel or a, a liquid solution on the gums. Or if it's like a more severe periodontal cleaning, they'll actually just do local anesthetic for you. Got the key it. is okay. you want to be comfortable because you want the clinician to be able to get in there and do a good job, right? And if you're jumping right. and you're like, ow, 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 this hurt, like they're yeah. not going to, be able to do a good job. So you want to be numb enough that you don't feel it. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. You know, and it's just, it's interesting to me, like, how the simplest solutions are readily available to us if we're just aware of them. It's all about, I I tell women this all the time, it's all about awareness. When you become aware, then you can make informed decisions and you can actually be certain that you're covering your bases, you know, across the board. So let's talk about some of the other diseases because, you know, it's one thing to be wanting to optimize your fertility, which is the primary focus for us in this conversation. But I think that sometimes people lose sight of the long game because, okay, great, you're pregnant, you're having this baby. But if you're all jacked up and you've got diabetes, I mean, because gestational diabetes, I read in the materials, can also show up as a result yep. of of these infections. But like kind of the more long term, like heart disease, the C word, you know, yeah. all of these things can be impacted by this as well. Yeah. So the, the big thing is, is, you know, back to the whole idea that bacteria leave the mouth and circulate the body. And when they get to other areas in the body that they're not supposed to be, they cause issues. And so if it's not treated appropriately, and this happens over time, it definitely can lead to or is correlated to heart disease, diabetes, the C word, specifically pancreatic and colon cancers. Those are really highly associated with oral bacteria. Alzheimer's is like, someone's going to crucify me for saying this, but directly linked to PG bacteria, P. gingivalis bacteria. So the mouth definitely affects the health of the rest of our body for sure. Like full stop. I can say that. If that short list alone doesn't scare people straight, about their oral health. I don't know what to say, Dr. Yeah. Katie. I mean, like, I I mean, because I always encourage women to think about the long game. Yeah. Okay. And like about gestational diabetes is, you know, people who develop gestational diabetes, only 10% of them are pre-diabetic before pregnancy. So that tells us that something happened during pregnancy to lead to gestational diabetes. And what happens is, you know, we have these placental hormones 
that develop. And as, as we go along, we know that those hormones increase inflammation. When you increase inflammation, you're increasing the permeability in our body and the permeability in our mouth increases. So if the bacteria are there, they have like a wide open gate or door to get into the bloodstream and circulate and cause damage. So that 10% number is important because we know that something happens to healthy people during pregnancy to, to cause them to have gestational diabetes. And the thing is, is it's a really high probability that those patients who have gestational diabetes will develop regular diabetes in five years. Very high probability. It's like 30 to 50% increased risk of getting full on diabetes afterwards. Well, and, and in the United States, I mean, we're already an unhealthy population. We're one of the worst and we're one of the wealthiest countries, you know, and I talk about this in the book, we're one of the wealthiest countries and one of the sickest at the same time. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have, I mean, it's, it's like rather than dealing with the root cause, pun intended, since we're talking about teeth. Yeah, that was a good one. I love yeah, that. Uh, yeah, I know. Dad joke crazy. But like, but it's interesting to me how, you know, with these simple solutions and these simple investigations, we can get to the core of some things that, yeah, I mean, there are many different pieces to the fertility puzzle, right? But if there's something as basic as your mouth, you've got to be addressing it. Totally. And I think the problem with our healthcare system is we become so siloed, right? We're over-specialized. And so we have a, a cardi, you know, a heart specialist and we have an endocrinologist, which special, specializes in hormones and diabetes. And we have a brain specialist and a bone specialist, and then we have dentists and then we have specialized dentists. And so, and dentistry was siloed from medicine over a hundred years ago. I mean, they literally just took dentistry out and put it on its own thing. And, you know, unfortunately the ramifications of that is that no one's looking at the person as an entire being, we're only looking at specific organ systems and ignoring everything else that is going on. And so it's really important that, you know, people like you are out there trying to empower people by giving them information because information is power. And when you have power, you can take control. And so I love that we get to educate, you know, even clinicians, not all dentists know this, by the way. So <laughs> by educating dentists, you know, physicians and patients all together, I hope that by looking at something as simple as the mouth and the treatments, like I said, are so simple. This is something that people can knock off their list and move on to the next, even if it doesn't, you know, improve their fertility, I can say for sure it will improve their health, which is a, you know, win-win anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, how could you not think about like downstream, all of these other things that can be impacted Right. Because sometimes, I mean, a lot of times, not just sometimes, but a lot of times we don't necessarily know what's causing a struggle with fertility. Yeah. Like they could never tell me. I mean, they love to pin it on my age. Yeah, uh, when I was going, I went in there like everything's fine. Your uterus is the right shape. It's in the right position. You have eggs. Your eggs are fine. Like, but we don't, we just don't know why this isn't working. I mean, no one asked about my oral health, which of course my oral health is fine, but they don't ask for anything other than, you know, what's in their their realm well and a lot of the measures for the testing right in those kinds of tests are based on sick people yeah like people don't understand that the like the the parameters for what's normal might not actually be normal yeah. and they might not actually be normal for you well and normal's right? not optimal right right that's the other thing that i don't like is they always compare it to our age right so what is normal for your age what is normal for most people your age and most people, you know, our age are sick or have some something going on. Right. And what's optimal or what's what's normal or optimal for you as an individual? That's that's individualized medicine is not where it needs to be yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about. OK, so women can go do this testing. They'll be smart. They'll reach out to you. They'll read your book, Save by the Mouth. They'll, they'll con contact you about testing and telehealth and all those amazing things like smart women would. Yeah. But like, what are some of the basics? Like, you know, we all probably it was, I don't know, second grade, first grade where we get the big toothbrush and the, and the, you know, all of those things. But what are some of the basic things that women who are truly committed to taking control of their health, their oral health, their fertility health might start incorporating into their routine now to support their health. I know in looking at some of the materials 
that you provided, there's alternatives to fluoride, there's, you know, safer things, particularly when we're looking to conceive and have a healthy pregnancy. Yeah, for sure. So again, I, I want to I can't overemphasize enough how simple this is. So what I tell people is if you're thinking of getting pregnant or you're trying to conceive, number one, go get tested. Because if you don't know, you know, that to me, that makes no sense. So go get a saliva test. Um, People, like you mentioned, can contact me. I can ship them a test. They can do it from their house. I can go over results with them and then work with their dentist to get them the treatment that they need. So number one, get tested. Number two, get a really good cleaning before you start trying to conceive or even if you are trying to conceive. Get your teeth cleaned because you want to start at a at an optimal level of bacteria in your mouth, right? So get healthy first. Once you're healthy, then it's really easy for you to maintain. A couple of things that people should be doing when they're trying to conceive or pregnant is getting cleanings every three to four months. The reason I say that is because we know bacteria repopulate in the mouth within 90 days. So if we're waiting six months, that's like double the time that we're having leaving that bacteria in the mouth. And within six months, you can develop gingivitis and periodontal disease. So instead of waiting for that to happen and treat it, why not be preventative and just go back in and get kind of a refresh or a reset? So I always tell people they should be getting their teeth cleaned every three to four months anyway. The six month rule literally came from dental insurance. It didn't come from science. So I know it's crazy. And it doesn't it surprise doesn't make, me. Yeah, it's, it comes from dental insurance, right? And what people don't understand is that insurance is not there to help the patient, right? Insurance <laughs> is a for profit business. And so it's, you know, again, the science shows bacteria come back within 90 days. So don't wait for disease. Let's be preventative and proactive. Get cleanings before we have infection. That's the best thing you can do. So even if you are pregnant, get in there every three to four months for sure. And if you're healthy, still go in every three to four months to prevent getting unhealthy. So once we do that, basic things that people can do at home is number one, everyone should have an electric toothbrush. I don't care what brand it is, but make sure it's something that plugs into a wall and it's not like a battery operated one. The reason is, is manual or battery operated ones, you're going to get about a hundred strokes per minute. The electric toothbrushes, you're getting like 1200. So it's just, it's like a, a power wash, right? It's a super cleaning. So use an electric toothbrush. And what people don't understand is that the bacteria that cause disease lie along the gum line. That's where they love to live. That's they live in the biofilm right there. So the, the saying is brush your teeth, but what you really want to do is brush your gum line. So angle the toothbrush, get down at the junction between your tooth and your gum line and gently brush. You don't want to scrub because if you scrub, you will damage your gum tissue and cause it to recede. So just use your electric toothbrush, which I love because it keeps you from putting too much pressure. Get along the gum line and make sure you're cleaning at the junction between your teeth and your gums. Do that twice a day for two minutes. That's a must. The other thing is, is that everyone has to floss. Like there, there is no, you know, fake news on, on <laughs> Facebook of, you know, flossing doesn't help. It does. If you think about it, your tooth has five surfaces. If you're not flossing, you're not cleaning two of the five surfaces. A toothbrush cannot get between your teeth. Like, let's just be logical here, right? Like, let's think. And our gums come to a point in between our teeth. Well, guess what? If you're not cleaning in between your teeth, that bacteria are going to get right at that papilla in between the teeth and get into your bloodstream. So you have to floss. If, you know, some people will say, oh, I can't floss because I, I gag or, you know, I don't have good dexterity or my teeth are too tight. Get a water pick because that's going to be just as good. So people can water pick or floss. I don't care. Pick one, but they should be doing it twice a day as well. Oh my goodness. I hope the women listening, hey, y'all skanky ladies, be <laughs> flossing your teeth. I mean, it's so I mean, it's it's so crazy. It's like, like showering and not washing your armpits, right? Like you have to wash every part of your body. You have to clean every part of your tooth. It's like non-negotiable. So when people say like, "Oh, I read on Facebook, you know, flossing doesn't actually help." That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. You're leaving two out of five surfaces dirty. That makes no sense, right? Oh, and it's so gross. Like if, so if you gross. if you're not willing to do it for yourself, do it for the people around you. Totally. Okay, yeah. like right, like just step it up while you're pregnant, at least, because that bacteria is getting to your kid. And then you know, it's also really important to, and you mentioned this with fluoride. 
you know, we are obsessed and you and I probably have a little bit of OCD, but we're really obsessed with like not only cleaning, but over sterilizing. Oh. And so we use these products that say kill kills 99.9% of bacteria. Well, that's not good because you're killing, it's non-selective. So you want something that kills only bad bacteria, but leaves your good bacteria there because your good bacteria are going to fight off the bad bacteria. But if you're using something that's going to wipe out everything, well, the, the point, you know, 1% that are going to survive are going to be like the zombie, super <laughs> bad, powerful bacteria, right? I mean, just thinking about it and we don't want those to survive. So make sure you're using gentle products that aren't full of chemicals that aren't going to wipe out your entire microbiome because you, you do want bacteria in your mouth. You just want the good kind. Yeah. So yeah. Those things. Get tested, get a professional cleaning every three to four months, brush and floss twice a day, have to, non-negotiable and don't over sterilize. Oh, I love that. And this is hilarious. This is one of the coolest conversations I've had in a in a minute, Dr. Katie. I think it's <laughs> awesome that you're doing what you're doing. Thanks. And so, yeah, and we're going to include links to your book, your website, your social, all that good stuff in our show notes. But is there anything that you would like to share with the women just as we close? You know, if you were, you know, if you think back to where you were on your own fertility journey, like, what would you want women to know right now? Like, if, uh, with a, a parting piece of wisdom. Yeah. that I love that question because, yeah, I have been through this. It was a six-year journey for me. And don't take all the information that you're giving as the end-all, be-all. Like you said, be an explorer. Go out there and search for, look under every possible hood to see if there's something else. Because the medicine that's out there, and unfortunately for women, Women's health is under researched, it's underfunded, it's not treated as seriously as men's health. I hate to say it, but it's true. And so we unfortunately have to take control and power back into our own hands and figure out what works best for us. And so if you have a little ping in your brain or in your gut that's telling you like mm, something that they're saying doesn't quite sit right with me, or I feel like there's something else, listen to that because you are your own person, you're your own human, and you have to find out what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the most powerful, I mean, you were dropping bombs during this whole conversation, but I think one of the most important things that you said, particularly in the name of women empowering themselves is don't let your insurance dictate oh. how you take care of your health for Frick's sake, man. Totally. Like go out there. If it, it's, if it's pay for out of pocket, it is an investment in your future. It's an investment in your family. Like we've yes. got to get beyond Yes. That insurance model, which a hundred percent, like anybody who has had anything come up in their lives, like knows. Yeah. That, I mean, I, I feel like I'm going to go on a tangent. I'm going to try not to, but no, that's okay. We do tangents all the time. Oh, that, and excuse my French pisses me off more than anything because I'd, I'd have patients come into my practice and they'd say, you know, I'd say, well, you need to do a periodontal cleaning and you need to do these adjunctive therapies. And if we don't do this, we're not going to kill the FN bacteria that is directly causing whatever ailment you have. And they would say, well, does my insurance cover that? And I, I'd be like, why does that matter? You know, there's ways that, that patients can find to make care affordable. Number one, care becomes most affordable when you intervene early. So a lot of people will say, you know, oh, it's not bothering me now. I don't have pain or I, you know, I'll treat it later when it becomes an issue. Well, when it becomes an issue, the care is going to be more expensive and more in depth. So let's intervene now, be preventative, be proactive, because that's going to be the cheapest time to treat it. So that's number one. Number two, you know, again, realize that the insurance company is not here to help you, right? Especially in dentistry. It's not actually insurance. It's like they give you a, a yearly allowance. That's a coupon towards care that you choose to get. It's right. not, this is what you need or what you don't need. There's no science or, or, you know, clinician sitting there saying like, of course you need to get this. And there was a Delta Dental, which I probably shouldn't even say this, but I'm going to, there was a lawsuit and people can look it up in Massachusetts where they got sued because they're supposed to use a certain percentage of patients premiums a year towards their care, which it's a very small amount. I mean, it's under like 40% of the premiums that people pay in that actually have to go to their, their care. And they used way less than what they were supposed to. And so they got sued and, and they lost and had to refund a bunch of money. So insurance is not there to help you. 
Is this at all surprising? Like, I never. I mean, it's, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of emails and get yelled at for saying. You know what? That's okay, though, because I I think the truth is coming out about a lot of these institutions and women need to understand that they need to wake up, get out of the fog and start educating themselves so that they aren't running around with the true misinformation out there about health. And there's a lot of, you know, credit cards out there, financing options that people can do where they can get, you know, 12 to 18 months, no interest to pay for medical care. And you can use those modalities or those financing options at, at multiple different, you know, practices. So it's not just dentistry. You could take that to your fertility clinic. You could take it to your primary care doctor. So, you know, get creative. Don't let money, which I, obviously money is a huge barrier to care. I, I understand that. And it is expensive, but it is, like you said, crucial to your overall health and long-term because the longer you wait, the longer you don't treat it, the more expensive it's going to get. Things yeah, don't well, heal on their own. Yeah. Well, and people will finance the craziest shit, but when it comes to your health or people complaining about, oh, I got to pay for this. I got to pay for that. It's your freaking life, man. And it's your dream. Like who else is going to pay for that? Totally. People go out and get a new car or they'll buy a new house or go on vacation, but they won't, you know, pay $1,200 for a periodontal cleaning. It's unfortunate. But (laughs) I, I also think it's because the the information hasn't been out there about how critical it is for your overall health, you know? So I don't, I don't fully blame the public because clinicians such as myself and, and other dentists and doctors, we haven't done a good enough job of getting this information out there to, to stress how important it is. Well, and that's it. And that's, and that's the thing, because once people have the information, then it's their responsibility to take it to the next place. And when you're serious about optimizing your health, for fertility and otherwise, your oral health has to be critical. So, well, thank you, Dr. Katie. Yeah. This has been, who knew you could have so much fun talking about well, thank <laughs> oral you. health? Dentists are not, you know, as scary as what everyone thinks we are. And the book is really fun too. So if people enjoyed this conversation in the book, I, you know, dropping cuss words, I'm even more cavalier <laughs> in the book because I wanted it to be a, an easy read for people, right? Like 100%. I, I oral health accessible and interesting. Yeah. Well, I I think that the the hundreds of thousands of women that are listening to this right now are going to be blowing you up because, and they'll be smart to do so because I think it's, this is a piece of information that we've been lacking. And, you know, when we're super committed to doing the right things for ourselves, we have to have conversations like that. So yeah. thank you, Dr. Katie, for your courage to be out there educating and we hope to have you back soon. Yeah, I'd love to anytime. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Love this episode of the Fearlessly Fertile podcast? Subscribe now and leave an awesome review. Remember, the desire in your heart to be a mom is there because it was meant for you. When it comes to your dreams, keep saying hell yes.